And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming campaign setting Ampliterra, Echoes of the Rift. To be frank, he is Austin Frank. How are you doing today, man? I'm good. We were talking earlier about, uh, you know, I've heard the thing a million times, and boy, that is that is one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, I, f I figured that one was going to be a bit obvious, but I had to get it it out of my system. No, I'm, listen, like, sometimes the oldies but goodies have to be done. Like, you, you just gotta. Mm -hmm. And, well, given how, given how I keep driving people crazy when I, when I, when I use the old question of who's the tank? You know, who's the tank? What's the mage? I don't know who's the priest. Yeah. <laughs> Dri drives people crazy when they, when they first get exposed to it. Yep, this is this is a play on the classic like who's on first, what's on second sort of mm -hmm. deal. Yep, I love it. Excellent, excellent adaptation for for the TTRPG world. Because mm -hmm. there are some people who want to do the t want to do TTRPG as the as these as these serious novel esque stories, and I'm like, motherfucker, mm -hmm. you play elf games. Embrace mm -hmm. embrace the That's crazy. Sweet. You cannot take yourself too seriously. That's that's half the fun. You know, why why play in a wild fantasy world if you aren't going to you know, throw reality out the window a little bit? Besi besides, the f I I have maintained that the first crack fic, the first fantasy crack fic is Discworld. Okay. I'm not familiar. Please um, please enlighten me. Ter Terry Pratchett's um book Terry Pratchett's book series and and universe um, has gotten adapted into a into a couple miniseries, namely The Color of Magic and Hogfather Knight, which I have been trying for the longest time to add to the Christmas canon. Okay. If we Excellent. can get if we can get Die Hard into the Christmas canon finally, then we should be able to do this. Yeah. Um, that that feels completely reasonable. But a lot of it is a lot of it is taking the piss on a lot of motifs within um, fantasy, not in a malicious way, but in a yes. Um, do doing things nuts kind of way mm -hmm. um, yeah i think there's a lot of value in like lovingly sending something up mm -hmm. you know like yeah, and like you can't take yourself too seriously and it's fun to riff on things that we all love yeah you have rinse wind who is who is a wit who is a wizard or accurately a wizard um, <laughs> who can't cast magic because of one spell in his head that is that is so dangerous and deadly. No spell wants to share space with it, which <laughs> was meant to be was meant to be a parody of the of the spell casting system in Jack Vance's books. Okay. Uh, and there and of course there's Nobby Knobs who is so, who is so ugly he has to have he has to carry with him official paperwork so that people know he's human. Oh God. <laughs> Oh man! Wow, I'm gonna have to check this one out. I'll put it on my list for for things to read next. <laughs> there's there's a lot of material, so take your time on that front. But yes, I'd like to go into the origin stories, uh, if you will. Um, yeah. What was your first introduction to role playing game, and what made it stick? Yeah, uh, I think the very first thing I ever got exposed to was the dimension 20 season unsleeping city um that was the the one from i think it came out in like 20 maybe 18 um so i'm a slightly more recent you know newcomer to this world um but there was something just so beautiful about the blend of like comedy and like game mechanics and this rich storytelling that just like completely sucked me in. I, I think it's like an 18 episode series. I probably watched it in a week and was just like, oh my God, like I need to be part of this. So like I, I showed my wife some of it. Um, she also loved it. We tracked down our local game store and started doing Indie 5e Adventures League. Mm -hmm. um, 
which was great. Like it was such a fun way to get into this community. And, you know, it was at this game store that's like two, three blocks away from our apartment. And so like the thing that first drew me in was that incredible rich storytelling and and humor and kind of like we were just talking about with like people not taking themselves too seriously but digging into these beautiful stories and then like literally the physical community of fantastic people play these games like that's what made us stay and eventually what turned this into this like whole big adventure that we'll we'll dig into more but yeah that's that's how i got started so with ampl with Ampliterra, was this was this a was this a campaign setting that you were that you were playing at your table and yeah. that's how it started exactly so this started super early in the pandemic uh you know i had just started dabbling in gming at the beginning of like I guess like end of 2019 early 2020 and had like played a couple of games in a in a different setting that i had made um when all of the like lockdown orders and everything went into place i think a lot of people were looking for that connection to other people um and so super quickly i reached out to a couple friends and i'm like i need something to do like let's do let's just do a one shot like i'm gonna make this this little region we'll play a game there it'll be great let's just do something together. So that was the very first game. I was looking at my calendar the other day and it was like March 27th or something like that, 2020. And it was set in Vinderheim, which is this like Northeastern continent on the world of Amplitera. And at that point, it was really like one city. I, I made Njarovic, which is the very first city that I ever made in this world. Um, it was very reactionary to like what was going on in the world around me. Like it was very, everything felt very unsafe and very unstable. And so this is this like very quiet, very like <sighs> safe isn't the right word, but like cozy town where everyone knows each other. Like it's all those things that we all wanted to be experiencing. Um, and so we did one game. It was meant to be a one shot, but then instantly everyone was like this is great like this is exactly what we all need so we kept it going and that that home game with that original group of people ended up lasting about two and a half years somewhere close to 100 sessions um and then had a couple of other sort of secondary games come in and out um yeah that's that's really how it got started hmm. now one th even with that, one thing that I find interesting is instead of what a lot of people have done and and make it a five um, e campaign setting, you've unless I'm mistaken, unless I'm misreading something, you've gone system agnostic. This is a, yes. this is a setting that can be used for any um, fantasy leaning TTRPG. Yes. And and probably probably a few universal ones if some if someone wants mm -hmm. to put in the work for that. Then again, yep. if you're playing a universalist RPG, you're putting in the work anyways. <laughs> right. <laughs> no bu no bully on yeah. universal games. I I like plenty of them, but th but that is a thing you're gonna have to deal with. Yep. So Definitely. what 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 factored into that decision to go that to go that route instead of instead of associating it with whatever um, game you were, you were using to run it. Yeah, so and and that's totally true. You know, I, I think that fantasy focused TTRPGs are gonna be best in this world. You're obviously not gonna be able to like grab a sci fi RPG and, and toss it into Amplitera. That won't work. But you could you, know, you I, could, but the you, amount of house really, ruling that you'd have to do would make would yes. you if would, you really <laughs> wanna put in the work, you could probably play Star Trek in, in Amplitera. But you know, we'll we'll focus on the fantasy side of things mm -hmm. for now. Um, yeah, but you know, like 5e, uh, Pathfinder, uh, I have not run this, but I have like read through Quest and think that's a super cool system that could work here. Um, the reason for doing that was really because this book is meant to fit story first. The things that me and my players found so enthralling about playing this game together 
wasn't necessarily the mechanics of the system we were using. Like, we love those. Everyone loves leveling up. Everyone loves picking new spells. Like, those are all fantastic things. And there are great systems that do that, that can jump into this world very easily. Um, but the things that we found so amazing as we were playing were like those really character driven story moments, the world building, the discovery, the like rich characters, things like that. And so the book really tries to put those things up front and make it super useful so that you can start taking those story threads and running with it um, to give a sense of like what's in here. Um, it's it's a campaign setting, so it's got this rich history of this world. It has 26 cities, a bunch of countries and factions, 75 plus characters, uh, and over 200 open-ended quest threads. And the whole thing is designed to be incredibly open-ended. So it gets you up to this point, this the, the era in which the game takes place, which is 385 post-beginning, and then kind of says like, okay, what are the answers to these questions? There's tons of conflicts. There's tons of things that need to be figured out. The book doesn't answer that for you. It asks you to like pick up the torch and keep running with it. So it's meant to kind of be that middle ground between something that gives you all the answers and all the tools and like difficulty of homebrewing your own world. Like this is a world that you can take and make your own with the tools that are provided to you. And um, something I did look at that I did look at that sample and mm -hmm. uh, one of the th one of the things that I noticed with that pat with the pattern within it that I do appreciate and some and some um, setting books I've seen don't really do this is putting in a section for quests essentially story seats yeah definitely the those were so. That type of thing was so useful to me when I was running my original home game. Like, you can go online and find lists of, like, 200, 300 quest threads. Chances are there are well, maybe five or ten in there that make sense for the type of game that you're running. And I love that feeling. Like, it's such a fun thing to have someone pitch you the ball so that you can hit a home run off of it. You know, like, you can come up with the incredible answer to the question. And so my hope is that someone can open up this book instead of reading through a hundred quest threads and 80 of them have really nothing to do with the type of game you want to run. Like you can go through and know that every single one of these could make sense for a game that you're running in this world. I I mean, I'm biased, of course, but I think that's pretty exciting. I think that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind... Are you familiar with the concept of Appendix N? No, I'm not. Um, Appendix N was a section in some of the old D&D books that went over certain certain me certain media whether it be whether it be books, television, film and, and the like that served as inspiration for either for either the game or some sometimes specific settings. Mm -hmm. And these days, it's kind of used as a shorthand whenever somebody puts in a section within a book, within a book that details some of the things that inspired that particular um, setting. Um, cool. As an example, um, Christian Nome, a friend of the show, his his um, Titan effect um, camp, um, setting for Savage Worlds has cite has cited stuff like X Men and Metal Gear Solid as gotcha. inspirations. Oh. Uh, we already got. We already mentioned the whole thing with Dimension Twenty, but what? Mm -hmm. And there was also that um, Spotify playlist you put out of music yep. that inspired Amplitera. But beyond that, what what sort of what sort of books, what sort of games, and and the like, would you say served as an inspiration for shaping um, the world of Amplitera? Yeah. So Dimension Twenty for sure. I love the tone of Dimension 20. I love that they tell big meaty stories, but there's still a ton of fun. They don't take themselves too seriously. There's a lot of humor in it. I think that's super important, at least to the types of games that I like playing. Um, the time that I was playing the original Amplitera campaign with folks, I was also working through the entire backlog of Critical Role uh, Campaign 2. 
um, like I'm sure a lot of folks were doing. You know, you had a lot of time on your hands and could really dig into some giant, you know, body of work like that. Um, so those are those are two big influences. But then even outside of that, this is going to sound silly, but I I found something recently that even though the book is already written, it's been written for about a year now, just like perfectly encapsulated the type of world that I wanted to make. Um, and that's the the Wayfarer series by Becky Chambers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, a sci-fi like space opera kind of thing. So like the the setting itself is pretty far off from anything in Amplitera, but there's this, like i'm trying to think of the right words for it there's this openness there's this um joy in discovery that i think she does an incredible job evoking um and i think that in her books there's so much like love for characters the way that people react to things that's so beautiful like so few of her books have any like giant over the top action moments but they're still like at least to me like completely enthralling because you care so much about the characters and learning more about the world and the customs and all of those things and so there's plenty of like very exciting very dramatic things in Amplitera but I think that 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 sort of goal is very similar where I want to create a world where like all of these people are trying their best and are trying their best to make the world a better place. And frequently where conflict arises when, you know, different people have different views of what makes the world a better place. And so even if you don't agree with, a character, you can at least empathize with them. You can at least understand where they're coming from. Um, so, so anyway, those are those are just a couple, um, but sort of the ones that that first come to mind. And like you said, music is a gigantic inspiration for me. Um, I've always been a, a huge music person, and so a lot of the the songs on that playlist were just like on repeat as I was writing this book in. 2021 when i started like actually putting pen to paper Mm -hmm. um things like olaf or arnold's who's this icelandic kind of like minimalist composer when i was doing a lot of vinderheim um it sounds silly but like the hades soundtrack the the video game hades soundtrack huge for when i was writing like a lot of oseros um and so those play a huge role in in sort of the emotions that I'm feeling when I'm writing. Yeah. Um, and it's not like it's not like I'm one one to talk when it comes to you when it comes to utilizing music to help help write. Since um, I've spoken hi- one composer I've spoken highly of and I use a lot whenever I want to emphasize the weirdness of magic mm. mm-hmm. is Philip Glass. Oh sure, um, totally. Who I I Philip Glass has done some has done some um, soundtrack work for for a few films. Mm-hmm. His big claim to fame was handling the music for the Katsi trilogy back in the eighties, um, especially mm-hmm. Koyan It's Katsi. Okay, which I probably mispronounced the pronoun- the way it's supposed to be said, but in my defense, it's Hopi. I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I am terrible with that language. Yeah, but. Especially, especially when there's like four or five definitions as to four or five variations as to what the word means, mm-hmm. because when when dealing with ancient languages, um, definitions can be up for debate. Sure, <laughs> I think is the be- that's a charitable way for way for me to put it. Mm. But just his his way of it his way of introducing. Mm. Um, electro- electronic into in, into classical stylings um, helps helps add to that fe- that feeling of weirdness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and since you mentioned Hades, I'm curious if there if um any you meant if any like video games or tel or television or even comics um, served as influence. Mm-hmm. 
Let me think. I mean, video games, I'm trying to think of like what I was playing at the time of like creating this world and and writing the book. Um Sayonara Wild Hearts had just played a little I think just before starting the original game. Um and that was a huge, huge part of like the feeling that I was trying to create. Um there are a couple songs in particular on that soundtrack. I was listening to over and over and over again when I was creating Vinderheim because it's like this really cool, like kind of ethereal, icy sounding pop music, mm-hmm. which is like exactly what I was going for with Vinderheim. Like it's it's icy, it's cold, but it's exciting and mysterious. Like that was absolutely a big part of it. Um, I think. I'm trying to, you know, line up the things that I've played with when I was doing parts of this project. I think when I was writing, I was playing a lot of uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, mm-hmm. um, which is still one of my favorite video games of all time. Um, but I, I love that game for sort of this, like, big soap opera-y story with, like, all of this deep lore. Um, when I when we were playing it, my, my wife is also a huge video game player. Um, we were just sitting there together. I was the one driving that one. But we're like, oh my god, this feels just like a TTRPG game. Like, there's something about the the like way you're discovering this information that's so, so tabletop. I'm, sur- um, I'm surprised that I'm surprised that nobody's ta- nobody's taking the plunge with with that. Although truth be oh. although truth be told, um, as tempting. I remember I remember I remember when I was playing it and a buddy of mine was watching and he was like. He was like, "Would you ever adapt this into five E?" And I said, "No." Would you? <laughs> How ever come? Adapt- well, <laughs> there's there's a handful of reasons As- aside f- aside from me being an- me being annoyed with people trying to adapt everything into five E, including That's fair. including That's things fair. that um ha- that have no bi- that have no business um being there, <laughs> like say Stargate or Hellboy. Sure. Or, right. Yeah. Okay. Or for that matter, Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, fair. But there is the big elephant in the room, and that is so so much uh, so, and that is the magic question. Yeah, that's fair. That's one of the things that has to be that has to be dealt with. The other thing is um d- is handling cl- is handling classes. Yes. Yeah. But that's one, reasonable. But one of the one of the biggest ma- one of the biggest matters is. How is how are you is how you're going is um. I am firmly of the belief that if you're adap- if you're adapting, a a a world like Horizon or or the Sol- or the Souls games or anything mm-hmm. like that. You have to be able to separate the character that you're pl- the character that you're playing as. With the with and, with the wor- with the world essentially you have to have that world. Be able to have that world without the central character. So in the case of Horizon, yeah, without the Aloy or whatever, you'd, yeah, you'd need to. I would have to ask the question of how how can this be done without Aloy? And it it can be done, but it requires a different approach. Yeah. If someone were to ask me what system I would use, probably Year Zero. Okay. Um, which is which is used by um, which is the system that Free League puts out and is used with stuff like Mutant Year Zero. The mm-hmm. a, the alien RPG, um, Coriolis, mm-hmm. and most recently Blade Runner. Yep, yeah. I totally that makes a lot more sense. Uh, especially since that system really doubles down on your equipment and your equipment reliability. Because mm-hmm. I th- yep. I think any any game that would try and adapt Horizon needs to double down on equipment and item creation and um, item yeah. create the I- item creation support in D. In- in terms of core, D, in, core in terms of core, um, D and D five E is um, fuck all. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's just not a thing. I would, yeah. I would have to, I would have to make, I would have to make the whole system myself, and I am, I'm not drunk enough to do that. At least not. Right. Yet. And at that point, it might as well just be its own thing. Like if you're yeah. having to invest that heavily in creating something new to make it work, like mm-hmm. just make something new. There's also. I will say though, board game of Horizon Zero Dawn is fantastic oh that I that is love that i that was my first foray into painting miniatures and like that was a blast absolutely love that 
Just remember, use two layers and thin your paints. Yeah, didn't thin the paints, and boy, that would have helped a lot. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? We learn. We grow. We learn. That's um, the process. Yeah. Um, I've o I've always had a th I've always had a think li think like an engineer mindset of you're go you're going to f you're going to fail, but learn from it and try again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, that's completely true for everything in life. Like, mm -hmm. so few things are successful the first time you try it. And I think it's the willingness to, like, just do it to yourself over and over that makes people successful in the end. Like, it's yeah. that perseverance. Abraham mm -hmm. Lincoln once ran a, um, had one of his first business ventures was a dry goods shop. It was a hmm. disaster. I had no idea. That's <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. But... When it comes now, since I brought up the since I brought up the magic question, and this is a this is a question I always ask whenever somebody's creating a fantasy setting. Yeah. Um, what? How? What sort of ma what sort of magic is is in play when it comes to Amplitera? Are we dealing with 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 high magic? Are we dealing with low magic? Where it's where it's this where's this subtle thing? Are we dealing with it being somewhere in between? Do we have do we have magic? Full on, full on academies. Yeah, what is the presence of yeah. magic within Amplitera? Fairly present. So I would, I would describe it as, you know, definitely not everyone is using it. If I had to like throw a percentage on it. I'd say maybe like twenty-five to forty percent of the population is actively using it. Um, but that being said, I think it is like the most important undercurrent in the world so to get you know without getting super super deep into the whole story and everything which could take us hours um the gist of this world is that in the year zero so if there's before beginning bb post beginning pb the year zero is the beginning um there was this group of wizards and artificers who made magic accessible to the entire world previously to that um it was only accessible to like very powerful clerics of gods or people living in a certain region of the world um and so this group believed that they could do so much good for the world by making this broadly usable and broadly accessible that happens and it essentially sends the two halves of the world down two very different paths. On the eastern half of the world, it brings in this era of prosperity and kind of a renaissance. You know, like there's a certain level of industrialization. There's um, lots of exploration. Uh, like you referenced, like academic study. There's sort of like a, <laughs> for, for lack of a better word, like a K through 12 magic school. And then there's a magic university. Um, and then on the western half of the world, it kicked off a series of events that has led to a hundreds year, hundred years long war. Um, it's been going essentially for 350 years. Um, and so I think that the the interesting exploration to be had here is like dealing with the question of was the expansion of magic a good thing? Um, and I think that I was referencing earlier with you know, being able to understand people's points of view, even if you don't agree with it. I think there are arguments to be made in both directions for like, yes, it has led to bringing people a better quality of life and standard of living. And no, it's led to all of this suffering on the other half of the world. So that's kind of the, the stakes. And then, you know, like I said, maybe 20, 20 to 40% of folks actively use magic and it can vary in power level. The vast majority of people are using like very simple magic for very utilitarian means. But of course you have the people who can like study and go really deep into it, who are traveling between the planes of the multiverse and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm guess I'm guessing that the way you've written this e this East versus West conflict is that ne is that both sides are right and both sides are wrong because and that's mm -hmm. something that is it's an easy trap for writers to fall into of having one side being pre-written as right looking right, right. at you um, civil war in t in terms of the comics 
Uh huh. Mm hmm. <laughs> I know. I know some people. I know some people like like the Civil War event in Marvel Comics. I don't. Interesting. You just feel like it was too like balanced towards pro superhero kind oh, of. Oh, um, the the conflict. What the conflict was was tr was on. It's on paper something I would be I would be perfectly fine with. Um, mm -hmm. After after a disaster, the the question of whether superheroes should superheroes should register with the go with the government is brought up, and this is something that's hung over say the say the X Men's heads for years. Mm -hmm. um, there's been there's been B plots about about mutant registration right. in a lot of X Men stories. Yep. But the problem the problem that I had with it was twofold. One, the the two. There was there was no real nuance between the between the nature of the of pro registration and anti registration. Both both mm -hmm. sides ended up being assholes, and I think one of the writers outright said that the it was the pro re, it was the pro registration side that was right. When oh, interesting. When the when the the actual the actual solution is a is a so, is a soft approach i.e. let people i.e. have people register so they can get some degree of training but not have them be treated mm -hmm. as full on government agents which was which right. was one of the which was one of the criticisms with with pro registration but it's it's the fact that there was this with us or against or against us attitude with both sides of the coin that just really annoyed me yeah that makes sense because with these kind with these kind of debates it's ne as much as as much as a lot of people like to think otherwise that it that it's that it's their side or the or the other side people are not so simple right yeah i completely agree i think um you know when i was approaching thinking about this and you know, like dealing with it myself and what i think about the situation in amplitera I don't know, like a lot of what I was thinking about at the time was thinking about climate change, um, you know, like dealing with climate anxiety and everything that comes along with that and grappling with like, I guess like magic is kind of a an imperfect parallel for something like fossil fuels or energy where it's this resource that this world has and it has the ability to do so much good, you know, if you think about it in terms of like the actual world that we live in, like energy has the ability to improve people's quality of life. It has the potential to help lift people out of poverty, it has all of these wonderful effects you can you can have, but at the same time, like the externalities of burning gas and coal and other fossil fuels are just horrendous so like it doesn't feel like there's just a perfectly simple right answer to that question and so it feels similar to Amplitera where it's like there is very clear good and there's very clear bad and how do you square that circle I don't know but I hope people will explore that and use this as a vehicle to through those questions for themselves and to hopefully find answers that make sense to them. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the other things I noticed when I went through that sample was the, was the use of of characters as well as, as well as to a lesser degree factions. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded of the character problem that ended up occurring with a lot of World of Darkness books. Okay. Um, and a lot of White Wolf books in general, where they had focused on the a lot of the story in within their lore focused on these characters of great significance, but there's the unfortunate question of how of how do you make sure that the players player characters are able to integrate within that setting, or instead of just being a um, backseat. Mm hmm. Which there yeah. are plenty of stories where you can do the whole, where you can do the whole. You guys are you guys are in the backseat. You guys are the are in the underdog situation. But right, eventually you eventually you want. I think people want to have their characters have some sort of significant impact on the world in this 
a small or a, or a large scale. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I think that this book, like, first off, has a really broad array of characters. Like, the, the different NPCs that you can you know, jump in with, do quests for, are all over the spectrum. Like, the, the sample you're alluding to, which is for the city of Abad, which is one of the 26 in the book... You know, you have the king of this entire country, who's obviously this super, super influential character. Um, but like some of my favorite characters in the books, uh, in the book, are the folks who are much, much lower stakes. Um, you know, I'm thinking about. I'm flipping through the manuscript here to to this one section that I'm thinking about. Um, but there are some characters that I absolutely love at the uh, the Scotty Outpost, which is this teeny tiny little, you know, calling it a town would be generous, the Scotty Forest. And one of the characters there is named Hux. Uh, they're a, a halfling, and they're just a person who like, lives way out in the forest because they have some things that they're running away from in their past you know, they are not the king or queen or regent of a country. They're not someone who's, like, the most absolutely important person in the whole world. Um, but they're just an in interesting character that you can meet and interact with. And the way that I've tried to design a lot of these characters um, is such that they frequently aren't going to be... I'm trying to think of, like, how to relate it with what you're describing as, as this issue in, in books. Um, they are sort of like pushing you down a trail towards interesting questions and problems to explore. They aren't necessarily the person who the conflict matters to the most that makes sense but they're going to get you towards a clue or a hint or a starting point where you and your party and your gm can craft that narrative and hopefully your gm can make it so that you are super important in that story and you you matter a lot to the outcome of it these are just starting points to like get you going down a path towards that interesting and fulfilling story yeah. if that makes sense and and um, given some of the art that, that I saw, I was curious if um, if the full book will have any entries when it comes to some of the monsters that could be that could be out in the wilderness of this setting. Yeah, I mean, there's bits and pieces. Um, there are, because it's system agnostic, there aren't stat blocks, mm -hmm. um, but things do come up in these various places um you know i talked about how there's the 26 cities the way that the book is structured in that section as you're sort of going through the world and learning about all these places it's broken up by continent at the beginning of that continent section it talks about the different factions and nations that you might meet in that area then it goes through all of the cities and then it goes through geography and landmarks because you know, environmentalism, naturalism, the non-sapient person built parts of the world are also super important to me. And those are a lot of the like really interesting natural places that you might go. And those have opportunities to like build out interesting, um, you know, like beast encounters. Like the, the Scotty Forest, for example, is a great place to run into elementals. It's a great place to, if you've seen the the illustration for Vinderheim, to run into a giant squirrel, um, different things like that. Um, so I, I think people will have a lot of fun with those. And I, I think that's also a great place to bring in your favorite rule system like all of the wonderful beasts that are made from there too, because I think these places are very flexible and that you can put lots of different types of creatures into them and they make sense. Yeah. Now with, the, with that in mind, 
I'm guessing. I'm guessing that um, that in, adi in addition to characters, there's going to be um, there's going to be spots written out for f for factions and organizations. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, with some with some of them, would those factions and organizations be represented by characters, or are some of them a um, description of a faction in and of itself? Yeah. So. Let's, uh, let me just pull one up and we can, like, talk through it. It depends. Like, the, the factions are really varied in their type. In some cases, it's a country. And, like, yes, a, a country will have a leader. Um, and very frequently, those leaders will get kind of their own character breakout. They'll have the quest threads, things like that. Um, other places, they're you know, like religious groups or like, for example, the Order of the Silver Elk, which is this very, very important group in this world is like a secret society. Um, they're one of my favorites. They're like the secret society of magic protectors. They were the group that ushered in the expansion of magic in the year zero. Um, and in that case, like, yeah, it'll talk about, like, who are people who are part of these factions that you can meet. Again, very frequently, those people will be detailed in different places throughout the book, frequently in the city that they're based. Um, there's so much room for people to, like, join those societies or organizations, find opportunities to, like, take on leadership roles if that's something that interests them. Um, something I really love about like the Order of the Silver Elk, for example, is they um, only have two active members at any given time. And so the the book has this presented at this point where like the existing member is aging out. And so it's an excellent opportunity for someone to get inducted into the secret society, potentially a party or a party member. Um, and then go down all kinds of fun storylines with the Order of the Silver Elk and like mm -hmm. their effort to protect the the source of magic in the world and everything that comes along with that. Yeah. Now, because it's me, and because I have to work my gimmick. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, I do. I do have to ask if it would be easy or difficult to inco to incorporate. Um monks within the setting oh so easy absolutely absolutely so the the perfect place for you uh would be the Sevian order mm -hmm. so that is uh sort of this like academic monastic organization um that's based in the town of mountains view which is part of the Sevian empire um the story with them is that the the individual who was most responsible for expanding magic across the world in Vinderheim, which is the continent to the north of the one that we're talking about right now, um, felt that he would best serve the world after the introduction of magic by going to the other continent and ha helping usher in this new force, like being a guiding hand. And so he, after he activated the font of magic, traveled to Salandria, which is the, the continent across from Vinderheim, and through a series of events, like, incorporated himself into the government of the Sevian Empire and founded Sevian Order. And so that group now is essentially, like, studying magic, studying how it works, um educating people on it they have like a relationship with the university that is in Seviador, which is the capital of the Sevian empire um and then they also in more recent years have built on to their mission studying the multiverse all of the different planes of existence um and so I I really love this group. I think they're a lot of fun. I love the the city that they're set in is kind of this like very far out from the rest of this empire city. And so 
you just get a lot of fun characters coming through there. Um, and then they're just this like super consequential group set in this tiny kind of rough and tumble town. Um, and so, yes, like a long answer to your short question of, is there a place for a monk? But absolutely. Like that would be my first pick. I need a little bit. Um, so, cause that certainly fits the knowledge seeking end of, end of monks, but Obviously, a lot of people when they're picking monk, they're picking the mar they're picking the martial arts bent. Um, sure. So, where? So I'd like to refine. It's the same question, just refining it more to more towards that aspect of monks. Hmm. Towards the fighting piece. It's a good question. I there's not like a a monastery or order per se that I think fit well for that, but. Fighting there academies. Is, uh, was that fighting academies? Not perfectly. Not that like perfectly fits it. But I'm thinking there are religions in the world, and there are five of them. I think that like someone looking to go down this path of like physical prowess and like refinement through like, strength and fighting might align well with Poteri the raven god who his whole gist is about like like success through power so like some of his commandments are like success is awarded to those who possess the drive and the will to seize it short term sacrifice is necessary for the greatest long term prosperity um, the path to achieving a noble cause is paved with trying decisions like things like that so I think that someone looking to do that sort of character could like align well with that religion he so sounds like he'd get he'd get along well with the likes of of um crom in conan's work mm-hmm definitely because i'm not sure how familiar you are with with um with robert e howard's um books but in that in that crom is depicted as as um his name being used more like an expletive than than <laughs> anything else I love that because you do not because his attitude is you do not pray to him. In fact, oh. the last thing you the last thing you want is to get hit, is to get the attention of Krom and his devils. He's okay. He's depicted as as this hybrid mix of like uh, because of the whole proto Celtic thing with the um, Sumerians mm. of a aspects of Serunos and um, Odin. Okay, and yeah. His mindset is if you if you're praying to me then you're too then you're too weak to actually get get whatever <laughs> blessings that that I that I would give anyways. Yeah, all right. Um, I could see that. And well on on the Atlantean sword in the first Conan movie is is written suffer no guilt ye who wield this in the name of Krom. That's um, awesome. And although although use although um using the films is a is a weird mix because um Call ne call not not call um Thulsa Doom was ne was never a was never someone that Conan had ever fought against. He's from the he's from the Call books. Okay. Huh. Uh, which are cer certainly certainly have certainly have that barbaric tone that you have with Conan, but it predates. Like Atl okay. Atlantis is still around when co when during Cole's time. Got it. Okay. But I can I can see I can see that similarity of of only res, only respecting those who are will those who are willing to go out and do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. I think that there's a very similar feeling there. Plus, plus you bring you bring it up ra you bring it up ravens. I'm pretty sure you were you had Odin in the back of your mind as well in the creation of. I mean, uh, sure. That. Yeah. For sure, oh. similar similar type of feeling. I'm guess I'm guessing within that the pantheon that you've got written, um, each god will have a set of bullet points that kind of give the broad strokes of their tenets. Exactly. So there's five. Mm -hmm. There's Cadus, the dragonfly god, who is sort of a god of life. Potere, who we just talked about. Sophos, the spider god, who's sort of knowledge and learning. 
um, Abris, the fox god, who's very much into trickery and, and things like that. And then Marina, the serpent god, who's the god of the seas and weather and, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could I could certainly I could I could certainly see it. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, with with that in mind, I I know you had put in the the quest entries, but have you have you considered a section de dedicated to um a, to a good to giving suggestions on how on how to how to get how to get the party to how to get the party together so it's not always you all meet in the tavern. It's a good question. Um, I there aren't like there isn't anything like that specifically, but I think that a lot of the quest threads give good opportunities for that. So, like, you know, to give an example from the home game that was the very first session that I ran where I was getting my party together. Um, there is a tradition in the town of Nyarvik, which is home to the Viffel Daughter School for Arcane Studies. Um, or when a student hits 13, they go out into the Scotty forest to retrieve something that will serve as their magic focus. That's like a really important, like physical and cultural requirement for this region. And to do that, because the, the school doesn't want to like just send out a bunch of well, literally a single 13 year old into this dangerous forest to go find a thing um, and make it this like big community event. So people volunteer from the school or from the surrounding community to accompany this person to the forest um and so like that is one of the quest threads for i think thyre viffledaughter who's the head of the viffledaughter school um where it's like she's looking for a group of people to go and help out someone on their their quest as they hit 13 years old um which you know, for us was exactly how our party got together and then, you know, had like a wonderful series of events in the, the Scotty forest that made them realize how much they needed each other and how much they liked adventuring with each other. And so they they went out to do it. Um, so I think that there are lots of opportunities like that throughout the book that are built into the quest threads um, that are good non you meet in a tavern for 20 bucks kind yeah. of things. Yeah. Yeah, because don't get me wrong, I I'm not I'm not opposed to the you meet in a tavern kind of thing, but it's it's been done to death. <laughs> yeah, it can get worn out. Absolutely, you need you need something else every once in a while. Uh, I th I do remember in er an early way that I kind of threw that on his head is setting it up like you like set, describing the tavern as if they were all meeting in it, and then switching to the, to them just getting kicked out because because they because they Love started it. another fight. Love it. Yeah. No, that's great. I, I think I think you're exactly right that if you're gonna use the tavern trope, you have to find a way to subvert it or make it interesting. Though like make don't, people think it'll be one thing. Whenever I always um I always exercise caution whenever t whenever people talk about subverting tropes because an easy trap to fall in is subversion for for its own sake. Fair. The yep. reason why I use that example, for instance, is to is to illustrate that is the fact that the party in this case are are notorious troublemakers who ha who have a bit of a reputation for mm -hmm. st for stirring shit up and that's why that's why any tavern owner is going to throw them out because they don't want to take the chance at least in that at right. least in that area right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yes yeah, some yes it's subversion but it's subversion with a purpose yep whereas a, a lot of people a lot of people were like would go would go i don't I, would go. We want to subvert it by saying you by saying you all, you all meet you all meet outside you all meet outside the ta outside the tavern. Well, yeah. you're just you're just doing <laughs> the same thing. You're just it's just the yeah, just doing it somewhere else. Yeah, but that's lipstick on a pig. Yeah. No yep. matter how no matter how much you slice it, it's still a pig. Yep. You gotta <laughs> find something different, something fun. I agree. Oh, uh, I think I I think I had one where it was. Where it was N Medias Res, where they were, they were all in, where they were all in jail and having to explain to each other, okay, how, okay, how did you, how did you land in the slammer this time? Good one, I like that. Yes, I've, I've always liked the, the, I've always liked the, um, the type of party composition where they're good, they're good at their job. They just, they just have cert, they just have certain 
hang-ups, mm-hmm. or the, or the, or they are they are the misfits, the problem childs, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Well, and that gives like so much room for character growth too. Mm-hmm. Like if you have something that your character perceives as a flaw or like something they need to grow in and they especially if they can like find that growth through each other that leads to such great character development and like team building i I love that kind of thing yeah i always encourage my my players to like you know put in some type of flaw in their backstory or like put a question that they or their character don't know the answer to so that that's something that we can all explore together. Like, I think that having those things built in makes for such a better experience. Because if you're if you just have a one note character that's not going to grow or go anywhere, it's just not as fun. Mm-hmm. You're just you're just moving through the motions. I think I had one instance of a char- of a a he was a dra- he was a dragonborn sorcerer who mm-hmm. referred to himself as the Great Draco, and. <laughs> The thing is, because I because I wanted to be he, calling him an arrogant bastard is an insult to arrogant bastards, or an insult <laughs> to him for lowering him to the status of arrogant bastard. Right. He is he is he is he is King Dick, and he and he will let ev he will let you all know about it. But more importantly, yeah. he is always he will always insist on being referred to as the Great Draco. You know, it's like a tribe called Quest. You got to yeah, say yeah, yeah. the whole thing. Yep. Which became a running gag where somebody where somebody would go, "Listen here, Draco." He's like, "No, the great Draco, get it right." It's <laughs> like, "Can I call you Draco?" No. Nope. Absolutely not. <laughs> oh, love it. And yes, what was some of it? To, some of it was to was to mess with the other players because I because I am. I am an I am an artist when it comes to messing with people's heads. <laughs> But it's a gift. Yeah, it's an art form. Absolutely. But it was it was also to kind of because a, a lot of people want a lot of people when I've seen them play Dragonborn they want to do the honorable Dragonborn that um, especially the, especially given the popularity of Dragonborn Paladins back in fourth edition. Mm. Mm-hmm. My mindset is let's let's um let's have let's have one who's an asshole. Totally. Well, and there you go. Like it's subverting an expectation and and doing something interesting with it, and like making a commentary about something else through your choice to do it differently. I mean, dra- dragons are always always known to be are always known to be arrogant, but a lot of the times when we see dragons depicted as fiction, it's the arrogant "you're lesser than me" kind of way. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to make somebody who's a- who's arrogant in in the way a um in the way a wrestling heel is arrogant. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 Um. And in- incidentally, you, if there are there are so many ideas I ended up stealing from e- from either years of watching professional wrestling of of all stri- of all stripes or um, yeah. Looney Tunes, especially all of yeah. my traps. <laughs> that's brilliant. I've never thought to do that. Oh, that's such a good idea. The most infamous one is one that I call the up button. It is a rune trap that you place on yeah. a you place on a surface. When somebody steps on it, they literally go up for okay. about, at forty miles an hour for about six seconds. Oh my god! Oh, uh, the way this was the the way that this was made into its natural conclusion was an encounter with a dragon in a cave lined with adamantite. So, and if you know about adamantite, you know that shit's not budging. Right. Well, the dragon steps on the button. He hits the ceiling. <laughs> And my GM's like, "Well, he's coming back down." No, he's not. That was only that wasn't even one second. He still had, he still has five to go. Yeah. And it's like, but there's he's not gonna he's not gonna hit he's not gonna break through adamantite. And I'm like, the effect doesn't care. It just says you go up. You're going yeah, in that direction right. no matter what's in the way. Oh my god. So, you ever see a you ever see a car in a compactor? Uh huh. Yeah. That's what happened to the dragon. <laughs> Oh no! Oh jeez! <laughs> I'm I'm guessing that was the end of the encounter. Yeah, you can't no. you can't exactly have an encounter with a dragon when the dragon is um a pancake. <laughs> yeah. A very a very me- a very messy pancake that was so disgusting everybody had to do constitution saves. 
those those are always the like best and worst moments as a gm like you know you put all this effort and like planning into like an encounter or a puzzle or something like that and then when your players just find some perfectly elegant way to undo all of the preparation you've made it's like a moment of pride in these people who are very clever but incredible disappointment like come on i did all this work like we're gonna do it i consider myself fortunate that sometimes my players do not know what was part of the plan and what i pulled out of my ass that's the mark of a good gm <laughs> so, absolutely so, i do remember one instance where somebody somebody praised me for how for how well i planned out a thing when actually i didn't i had 30 minutes worth of prep and i just had to wing it and I, did, I didn't i didn't tell him so now yeah, I'm telling no, everybody listening to this, but but uh. he th he thought I had completely planned it out when I when I was flying by the seat of my pants. Fantastic! Well, Which... congratulations. <laughs> That's a huge compliment. Yeah. Oh. I'd like I'd like to think so my t my that some time with th some time with theater certainly helped. Um, yeah. Especially since I mean I, don't I know think if... you see a lot of theater kids in this hobby. Like oh I I know I know. I know that there's a lot of th a lot of theater kids because and I because the theater brats are always really easy to pick on. <laughs> like if there's a, if there's any repeat target I have when it comes to trolling, it's always theater kids. Oh no! <laughs> not not mal not maliciously, but all but finding finding new and interesting ways to push their buttons. Um, right, right. the The only ones who I will go out of my way to outright torture is any t is any time. A um, anytime a theater kid is trying to play a corpse, because that's wow. that's what you do. That's what you. D You're familiar with corpsing, right? No, I'm not. Please, please share. Please, corpsing. Me. Now the the idea is you're supposed to be playing a corpse on on okay. stage on, and um, because of that you don't move. You're not supposed to move. You're not supposed to blink. You're not supposed to react. You're supposed to be dead. Right. Okay. Sure. During rehearsals, from personal experience, everybody will do everything they can to make you crack. Yes. Yep. Okay. And if and if you and they and um they will but they will bust you if you even so much as move your lips. <laughs> like if you, they'll tr they'll they'll usually try and make you laugh, and of course you have to be yeah. completely stone faced the whole the whole time while having right. your eyes open. <laughs> oh my god! And they will, That's they purgatory. Will, that sounds yeah, terrible. Yeah, they it 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 is a special kind of hell because they because they yeah. will go out of their way to try and to try and make you break. You will break. They're, yeah, <laughs> it's inevitable, of course. Um, at least, and of course, the other thing is the is how infectious giggling is. One person oh, giggles, yeah. then everybody giggles, and then the then the director wants to kill all of us. Yeah, it's it's like a yawn, you know. You're not getting out of it. It's just it's coming for you. But and admit admittedly, admit admittedly, I have my own punishments whenever people do dumb things at my table. Um, one of them is um, you is um, if you if you um, if you say if you say you're not gonna botch and then you do, you have to drink a bottle of bacon soda. <laughs> Excellent. That's B A C O N soda. Oh, I, 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 I feel like I've seen this before. It sounds bad. It sounds vile. It's what would happen if you put bacon grease in club soda. Oh God, that sounds <laughs> really nightmarish. That's that's because, well, it is. The other option yeah, right. <laughs> is what I used to. I used to use this whenever I used to use stuff like that whenever we would play. Whenever uh, my buddies and I would play Goldeneye, and somebody picked Odd Job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's it was either that or everybody punches you in the dick. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. That sounds like a tough choice to make. Well, the the, the idea is the idea is do is you'd have to go through something so painful that it's not worth right. it. Right. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Deterrence, mutually assured destruction. Pretty much. Yeah, right. It's the other the other option was the pain glass, which is a shot glass filled with water, salt. Sea salt, pepper, black pepper, and about four different hot sauces. Oh, jeez. Yep. Well, sounds bad. Well, if I'm gonna call it the pain glass, I gotta deliver. Right. That's true. It's, the, it's the only right time, the only the time title. that I've the only time that it's been a bit trickier is when um 
when I've got people coming in from the south who have a higher spicy tolerance, mm -hmm. then I have to then I have to get out the heavy stuff. Right, right. Got up your game. Like insanity sauce, where that where there's a big ass um, warning on the label: do not use more than one drop. Wow. Or I gave one I gave one person the Carolina Reaper once. Jeez. Like <laughs> you want to talk about pain? That's a good way to talk to go to uh -huh. go through pain. No um, kidding. I have eaten that thing once, and I swore off spicy ever since. Wow. Because right. I'm not going to be picking that up. <laughs> I ended up I ended up inventing about I'll 15. Leave that to you. I'm not touching that again. But <laughs> I'll leave that to your players. Yeah. Whoever's getting it. Well, the the minds the mindset I have is the campaign is going to be scary, so I'll just be scarier. All right. Yeah. Oh. Fair. Also known as the commissar method. The imperial guard isn't scared of the enemy; they're scared of getting shot by the guy in the back. Mmm. Okay. Yeah, but um, now with with that in, with that in mind, you're shooting for, as I understand it, you're shooting for about 275 pages. Yep. Oh. Uh, and are you? It says you're hoping to to get to get it out in um, October. Yep. Um. Is that is that the time you see you see the um di the digital version going? Obviously, the physical version is going to go through its own bit of hell. Sure. Yeah, right, of course. Yeah, I think it all ideally should all be coming out about the same time. Um, at this point, like, it's fully written, it's fully edited, you know, we worked with a cultural consultant and two editors. Um, we have all of the like plans for the art ready. It's just a matter of going out and finishing up the art. And we have some fantastic artists who are going to be working on that with us. Um, yeah, so really, it's, you know, finish the funding process and then we're going to get to work and have it to people in the fall. Yep. And I I will certainly be looking forward to it. Um uh, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. The the hike up the mountain in the snow was a lot, but like I'd say it was worth it. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often Excellent. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>